following on from the last lecture, um, here are the elements of image interpretations you've seen before, size, shape, shadow, tone, and color, texture, pattern, and association, site, location. So we're going to break these down into two groups so that we don't get an overly long lecture. Um, we're going to start with shape. So here we're looking at on the left, um, uh, anthrop well, in both cases, we're looking at anthropogenic features. Uh, on the left, it's an airport. Um, you can tell it's a airport and not in another kind of industrial um, industrial plant because uh, you can see runways and then you can see the um, the roads leading up to the runways. Okay, so you always need those roads to get back and forth to the actual runway. And so you see that distinct pattern and sort of the crossed hatched roads. Um, and that, that makes it clear it's an airport. Uh, on the right, uh, we're looking at cutting units. So in this image, this is a um, tassel capped image. Um, in this kind of image, um, red represents uh, dark red represents mature forest, pink represents newly cut cutting units, and um, green looks like herbaceous, um, but but non-woody, non-woody vegetation, sorry. Um, and you can see immediately you're looking at the boundary between the Yellowstone National Park and the Bitterroot National Forest because to the left, the Bitterroot, um, we have these very large patches um, and between them we have um, areas of forests that have been retained. Those are along um, streams and other sensitive areas um, to avoid um, erosion impacts. And on the right, of course, we have areas that have, have not been cut, uh, except of course in tiny places for you know, recreational features. Uh, more shapes, so anthropogenic features. You know, to the left, we've got a baseball field. Um, to the upper right of, of that little four little panels, um, that is a rural airport. So you can see it's kind of, it's basically out in the middle of a, of a, a overgrown field. Um, and you've got, you know, the capability to fly in from two different directions. Um, those are probably placed based on local knowledge of what the predominant winds are. Uh, in the lower left there, it's kind of hard to see what that is. Um, you know, you've got uh, um, sort of a semicircle there, and it's got lots of little lines and some roads coming up to it. Um, this is actually a uh, drive-in theater. So each one of those rows are a place where a car would park. If you look very carefully, you can see in the middle of those areas, there's uh, a little house or a small building, and that's where the projector is. Um, in the lower right of that panel, we're seeing the uh, building of an interstate. Um, and you can tell it's an interstate because um, it's, um, well, fairly wide roads, okay, smoothly curving. I don't know if people know this now, but in uh, the interstate highway system was put together in the um, aftermath of World War II because generals who came back, particularly Eisenhower, who came back from Europe, realized that you know that both uh, both attacking and defending forces were very much limited by their ability to uh, move. Um, large vehicles around. And so as a consequence, uh, given the large size of our country, they wanted to have an interstate highway system that would allow, um, you know, quick transport of very large vehicles. So it's always smoothly, um, smoothly, uh, smooth curves. Um, and you can see at D right there, there's a bridge. Um, you know, there's no no stop signs or um, traffic lights. Um, so everything is bridged over on the interstate highway system. And that just gives you an idea of 
Um, and you can see to, to the left actually where it sort of forks and you've got an exit um, for the highway uh, or, or an entrance, I'm sorry, an entrance. Um, and again, all that has to be smooth so that traffic can, can merge uh, smoothly. To the right, um, the objects at top, um, you know, you got to look, you got to look at those, you know, you look at the size of the cars uh, and the truck to the right on that road, that gives you a general sense of the, uh, the size of what you're looking at. And you've got some things that seem to come in either uh, uh, one width or two. Um, and you see the little lines, um, the little bright lines on top of the ones that are sort of at that two two sided width. So that's, um, it looks like a, um, a sales area for single wide and double wide trailers. And then at the bottom right, you know, this is one of the most ubiquitous um, shapes that you see on um, the North American um, landscape and the clover leaf. And so again, this was developed um, during the creation or widely applied. I don't know if it was developed for the interstate highway system, but widely applied at that time. And um, so you have the ability to, you know, the, the left right um, road is completely separated from the north south uh, road. And there are smooth uh, entrances and, and exits from each of the lanes. Okay, so let's look at the shape of natural features. Uh, to the left, you know, we're looking at lines that are highly suggestive of topographic features. And you sort of see this gradient of uh, very bright areas um, in the upper left-hand corner to, um, well, at the bottom, you have forest land. You can see that because it's very rough. And then you have some darker areas. This is highly suggestive of a field in which there's um, uh, erosion problems uh, and perhaps some um, uh, irrigation problems. It's probably high slope. And so as a consequence, you know, you've got water pooling at the, the bottom and dry soils further up the, the hill. And you've got these um, plow, um, uh, plowed areas that um, serve to um, serve to uh, uh, retard erosion. Uh, in the upper middle, uh, that's those are palms. Um, so palm production in Southeast Asia is a, uh, well, palm oil production in Southeast Asia is a major environmental problem. And uh, actually there's been enormous work done recently on the mapping of not only palms, but also trying to get a sense of the soils beneath them because the soil, soils can uh, store an awful lot of carbon um, because they're peat soils. Um, to the right, here we have some natural features. Um, we have individual trees. This is a color infrared image. So each one of those individual red dots is an individual tree. And we've got some interesting geomorphology going on in there. It looks like that's probably a river and, uh, and not an ocean, just based on the, the geomorphology. And you can see there's a little island there and a nice sandy area connecting the island to the, um, uh, to the, the main part of the land there. And gosh, I'm sitting inside, you know, under, under uh, COVID conditions and looks like a pretty good place to be to me right now. In the lower left corner, this is a, a what's known as a patterned bog. And so, you know, bogs are areas that in general are low nutrient areas um, and uh, very moist. So they're wetland areas. Uh, and you can see in there that you have these areas, sort of curving areas of open water. And so looking at that and knowing what kind of area you're in, there's an awful lot of ancillary information that you can get about that area. For instance, probable species um, uh, distributions just on being able to see that overall um, 
shape. Uh, some more natural features, uh, in this case, uh, water related features on the upper left hand uh, corner is Dead Horse State Park in Utah. And this is a, a horse neck um, feature. So you've got the river there that's darker. Um, the river has, has cut into the rock. And um, as time goes on, it, it's more likely that, that water is gonna cut down than horizontally. Although there is some horizontal cutting as well. Um, but so as a consequence, you get the river being, you know, thousands of feet below the other surface of the ground. Um, and these are known as entrained features because once you get them going, they're pretty much always going to stay uh, roughly in the same area. Um, in the upper right, these are um, uh, polygon, polygon, polygon shaped um, areas in a bog, in a, a wetland tundra. Um, and so uh, these areas are formed by um, ice wedges occurring in the, in the, uh, the permafrost there. And over years, uh, they're freezing and thawing. Um, uh, you know, junctures are created between different polygons. Um, lower middle, um, that is a, a glacial uh, stream. So you can pretty much tell, you can always tell when you're looking at one of these because you get these great pulses of water and that tends to uh, give it sort of an unorganized appearance on the landscape. And to the bottom right, um, this is a meandering uh, stream. It's kind of the opposite of the entrained uh, stream up there because you know these are uh, found on lowland plains where in general there's no um, there's no geology you know at the the surface or near the surface of the, the ground it's all you know relatively fine um, uh, soils and even if you started with a, a straight river um, in a place like this you would have this meandering pattern develop. And so um, if you um, if you know this kind of area at all, then knowing where you are relative to the kind of, of meander uh, um, segment you're, you're next to, you have a pretty good idea of what kind of uh, for instance, vegetation and wildlife you're going to see in that area just by knowing the shapes of features and the adjacency. Moving on from shape to size, um, you know, something that seems obvious but might be useful. You might not think of it at the time. So if you have a known reference, you can, you can use that to determine the scale of an area. Maybe it isn't worth it for a particular job um, to um, calculate the scale. Uh, maybe you have a lot of topography in the image that leads to varying scale. And so you don't want to have to keep recalculating that. Well, if you have a reference um, that can add in, in determining scale and determining scale can then help you with other aspects of interpretation. In the left hand image, you know, this is a school. Uh, it's got a baseball field. It's got a, um, it's got a track. It's got some tennis courts. Um, all of these things can uh, be related to standard sizes and used for things like, you know, measuring the total size of areas or, you know, the widths of roads, things like that. Um, at the right, another known reference, um, you know, we've got cars near the bottom um, of the image. You'd, you'd want to zoom in to be able to separate cars from, from pickup trucks. And you have a series of um, RVs and uh, large trucks above it. And if you zoomed in and could identify, you know, individual types, you'd be able to determine what the scale is, and then, you know, and then move ahead without the time-consuming uh, process of figuring out what the actual scale is for a given place. Uh, more 
means for known references. Um, uh, railroad tracks are uh, standard spacing between, so you can use those for measurements. Uh, again, I've got a baseball field in there. That's kind of the most obvious thing, and you see it a lot, so you can use those. Um, we've got some kind of warehouse in the upper right, but the width of those trailers uh, will allow you to figure out scale. And then at the bottom, um, um, there you can figure out from the the size of the truck there just how large or two trucks uh, just how large individual industrial features are. Uh, more scale uh, things that you can can use. Um, you know, if, if you ever looked at a aerial image from uh, the West, you know that um, everything is broken up into, um, uh, well, there's a, a, a square grid that is superimposed on the features. At the left, it shows you, well, you know, where, um, where natural features kept them from having, um, you know, an absolute grid. Um, they had to, to improvise. But if you look on the right, you see a very good example of the, the grid there. Um, the grid is um, uh, one section is one mile by one mile, which is 640 acres. You will then see um, uh, quarter sections. So those will be half a mile by half a mile and 100 and what is it, 160? Let's hope so. Okay, so now we get to some of the things you you might have thought of um, uh, before you thought of size and shape, which would be um, tone um, or color. So in the left hand um, um, photo, you know, if you spent again any time looking at aerial photos or driving around the West, you'll see a lot of um, central pivot irrigation circles. So there's a well in the middle of one of those circles and water is pumped up and uh, is used to irrigate those areas. They generally come in two sizes, again, quarter uh, section and section sizes. Um, although, you know, you see them in a variety of sizes depending on the, the field size. Um, so that's a, a land cover. These are dark um, and um, in this context, that suggests they're vegetated um, because this looks like um, infrared imagery and, um, I'm sorry, this looks like panchromatic imagery. And if vegetation is there, then it's going to make the area darker. Uh, on the right, um, we have um, an area in town. This is the Fort Collins. Um, community, uh, no, Fort Collins golf course uh, north of town. And you can see these red areas. Uh, that tells you it's a, a golf course, you know, these long red areas that are the, the fairways. And uh, I want to draw your attention at the bottom uh, center to this dark line. And, you know, this is where tone comes in handy. If we look at the rest of this area, roads tend to be bright. So they're probably concrete roads. Um, and this line is dark. So the question is, well, what is it? Well, you know, the only thing you have around here that would be sort of sinuous and dark is um, irrigation structures. So you're pretty sure that's an irrigation structure. Um, so grayscale tone is a general property of image, regardless of the spectral data being shown. So here we have um, a uh, various bands from a panchromatic, I'm sorry, black and white infrared um, series of images. I know that because I'm looking at this area, it appears vegetated and in this, the bottom right hand corner, uh, that area is very bright. So as a consequence, that's got to be uh, vegetation. So, um, and then over in the upper right-hand corner, 
that's uh, probably red because it's darkest, right? Uh, and because, you know, light is actively being absorbed in the red. And then in the, the upper middle, that's green. And uh, that's because green is brighter. That's vegetation looks green. It's brighter um, in green than either red or near infrared. Other examples of tone. So on the left, we have color infrared. Um, and on the right, we have green or color. Sorry. On the left, we have color infrared. On the right, we have, have true color. And I just want to draw your attention to these, the same area in both sets of images. So in the color infrared, you have a very dark area, um, uh, sort of circular. There are a couple of them. Um, and in the color, the contrast is not nearly as great as in the color infrared. Well, these are actually cloud shadows, okay? And the reason the cloud shadows look uh, darker on color infrared imagery is because color infrared um, imagery does not record blue. Now remember, blue is the color most highly scattered by Rayleigh scattering and the most highly uh, scattered uh, uh, band or spectral band being uh, scattered in general um, because Rayleigh scattering is the, the strongest type of, of scattering. So what you're seeing is we're not recording blue at that area. And um, the cloud is blocking the direct illumination from it. And then because we're not recording blue, there isn't a lot of light that's scattered through the atmosphere and then back to um, that area, okay? So what we say is there isn't a lot of direct illumination um, directly from the sun. And there's also not a lot of diffuse illumination that's coming generally from the atmosphere. In the color image, right, you don't have the direct illumination because again, the cloud is blocking it. But because the color imagery is sensitive to blue, it's illuminated by the diffuse, uh, diffusely scattered, um, primarily blue, but also green light. Texture. So texture has a specific meaning in, um, in remote sensing, image interpretation, and that is you're looking at repeated patterns of um, either tone or color that are too fine to be seen at the level of um, individual objects. So at the left, that's actually an area near Pingree Park. And you can see areas um, and areas with different textures, whether they're very fine um, or very coarse. But you, you, in general, you can't see the objects themselves. Okay. Uh, in the upper center part, You've got a couple of different textures. You've got some kind of water feature in the middle, north of that or above it. You've got some coarsely textured vegetation and then some finely textured vegetation south of that, that river feature. Um, but, you know, in general, you can't see individual objects. You can actually see a couple of little gaps in that fine textured area, but in general, you cannot see it. Uh, uh, individual objects. And so that is um, an example where you'd use texture or to describe it. Um, in the upper right hand corner, those again, that looks like a plantation. Uh, you can kind of see individual objects, but in general, you're seeing more the pattern um, rather, oh, I'm sorry, you're seeing the, the, the overall texture and not the individual objects. Um, Lower center, uh, you've got some kind of farm area, you've got trees with, with different textures, and then you've got some sort of crop in the back. And again, you can't see the objects, but you can see the, the texture of them. And finally, on the, the lower right, we have an area that um, uh, where you not only see differences in tone, but if you look carefully, there's a horizontal, almost horizontal line going from left to right. And then um, just below that line, 
there are um, the remains of uh, sort of left right trending uh, plow lines, I assume, because it's, it's a clearly an agricultural area. Um, another example of texture here, we're looking at the, the little, there's sort of a curving line um, from the left of the image to the right of the image, not, not the very bright wide one, but above that. And um, uh, you see these stacks of you know these linear objects and you if you magnify them this is what you see um, and when you when you see this you see there's a, a railroad track there you see there's some sort of industrial feature you know these are logs so this is a sawmill uh, in Oregon um, and this is the raw material